Another just what seemed to be a mundane Sunday. It was just another Sunday. I preached and uh, I gave a. There was a new young gal in the church that Sunday. And I gave an altar call. I just asked to raise her hand and I saw her raise her hand. And so afterwards, the privilege of leading me to the Lord. And she just responded and she had such a good spirit. And uh, God just was moving in her life in such a wonderful way. She was just growing so quickly in the Lord. Uh, I think my wife Barb worked with her as well. And I was right at that point needing a, we were having a transition in the office. I was needing a new secretary in the office. And so I asked Renee if she would uh, help me out there. <laughs> and so I uh, had Renee come in and while she was there, once she shared about the fact that she was so deeply concerned and she would, she would weep a lot of times, she said, I've got a sister in town that is so talented. She's uh, had a wonderful job. And she's willing and dealing with some of the leaders in the community, whining and dining them. And she was so concerned, she said, I, I think that she's getting addicted to the wine, to the alcohol. And she was so uh, troubled about that. And it was just not that long later, I was just in my office, that's the Saturday morning, I was thinking of, I was just in my office, just sitting there and heard somebody come, went out and here was Renee, leading her sister in, who was, uh, what should I say? Oh, uh, she, Renee, to hold her up and get her in there. And I didn't know if uh, she had any uh, understanding at all. I tried to lead her to the Lord, and uh, it was really a, a strange time. I didn't know if she had anything at Penetrated, maybe it did at that point, but it was a unique thing. Renee and I were both lined up to help out that morning at the bowling alley for a fundraiser for Youth for Christ. <laughs> we committed ourselves to that, and so here we were, and we had Wendy here, not knowing what to do with her, and uh, she needed to sleep us off. So, I did something that uh, never done before in my life. Barb liked her home private. She was just a private person. We just didn't have a lot of people running in and out. And uh, I don't think I even called ahead. I just uh, got in my car and, I, and Renee got Wendy, her sister, into her car, and we drove over to my place. I brought them in. Renee laid Wendy down on our living room couch, and we let her go bowling. You know, I, I did touch Barb and let her know what was happening. She couldn't do anything about it. Here's this gal laying on the couch. And uh, the story goes that Barb absolutely had no experience with anything like this. She started crying and uh, didn't know what to do. She came over to Wendy and just, Wendy was just kind of sleeping it out. And uh, so she went away. Barb, started to pray. So when she's praying in tongues and she's praying in spirit and, she, and uh, uh, 
I don't know when Wendy wants to share it, but, but I'm going to have her come and uh, why don't you just come and share what God did for you and uh, the ministry God has led you in because Wendy is one that's come from our church into serving the Lord in a very full time way. I've never heard Lauren talk about this. So, Bart shared with me a little. I don't. I felt when I came in here today, when I drove here, I haven't been back here for so many years. I just felt like I could feel the. I could feel some of that. I don't know how to explain that, but it was like, this is overwhelming because I haven't been back here and it just reminded me how intense that time was for my life. I wasn't sleeping off anything. I was dying. He doesn't apparently know that. I was dying. And my sister, I had been out for so long. I had been out there for so long that I don't know what she knew because I, I really didn't I wasn't into relationships at all, but I, I was a chronic alcoholic. I was also on amphetamines. I was on other things. I did have a good job, but people didn't know how addicted I was. I didn't get addicted because of my job. I came up here that way, and I continued my addiction. I ran from Mason City, Iowa, to try to get away from the people because of how addicted I was there and the trouble I was getting into. And then I come here, I don't know anybody, I'm gonna start over, I'm not gonna be this person. And then I was this person and worse. And so I was such a creative person that I became whatever I needed to be. But I can't even tell you how much I had to drink and use to be able to do that. And so I had been violently assaulted here two years prior to that by someone and I, I lost my will to live at that time. And it just got so bad that it, it was hard for me to walk. It was very hard for me to walk. And in fact, I couldn't eat either because I shook so hard that I couldn't even put food in my mouth. So Renee had come up here and then she has this experience and Renee had been, she has been a train wreck down in Iowa too. And I thought, how in the world is she sitting still? How is she sitting still? Because I couldn't understand anything. I was in some kind of drug psychosis that I couldn't get out of. And I'm watching her I'm not understanding her, I'm just watching her thinking, how is she sitting still? Because we didn't sit still from the time we were born. So I just kept watching this piece on her and I thought, I don't know how that could have happened. I know who she is. And so I just kept staring at her and then she's the one who said, I'm gonna take you to my pastor because obviously she knows I'm not gonna make it and she wants me to not, I told her I'm going to hell like any day now. And so she brought me out to see Pastor Warren up in the office in the corner and I just remember looking at him and he's passionately sharing something with me and I couldn't understand anything he was saying because my mind was no longer functioning, I couldn't be anywhere. And then I said to him, I don't understand anything you're saying to me. And he said, Jesus Christ can cut right through that. <laughs> and I tell the story all the time. And I tell people it was the equivalent of a bullet hitting me in the head. Because I heard it and I kept hearing it and I kept hearing it. And I'm sure he prayed with me to receive Christ, but I have no idea what that even is. So I don't know. If I, I don't even know if that happened. I just know he prayed with me, that's all. I don't remember if I prayed or not, but I had no recollection of, 
I had no knowledge of it. I just didn't understand anything. So then I leave, but I'm so sick. I'm so physically sick from things that are happening. And people could see I was not going to live. They knew that. So there was all these people checking in on me. And so I think it was like a day or two later, two of my work friends came and told me they were forcing me to the hospital. And I told them I would go to urgent care, but not the hospital because I'd already gone around to all these ministers in the daytime trying to find some way that I wouldn't go to hell. And they all kept saying, we'll take you to detox, but we're not going to, we need you to go to detox. We'll visit you there. And I thought, I can't go to detox. I will die there. And so I, I figured out I'm going to hell. There's no one in this town that has hope for me. And so then, so then after meeting Lauren, then my two friends take me to um, this clinic that was way out on the west side. And the doctor was like packed room. All these people were flu season or something. It was in February. And so he just gets me and he's like, why are you shaking so bad? And I said, I don't know, I'm having a breakdown. And he, I didn't tell him the truth because he asked me if I was addicted and I said no. And then he said, I need you to come back. I think something's more wrong in your life. Like I wasn't a good color. I was in really bad shape by then. And he said, what do you need right now? And I said, I need something so I stop shaking. And he gave me a prescription for Dilaudid. Back then there wasn't this, the control on it. Well, I was definitely not an opiate user, but I thought, okay. So it had four refills. I didn't take any of them because I didn't want any opiates. But at the end of that week, I was so tormented and I was, I was so sick. I was so physically sick. I was throwing up everything. I was throwing up water. I, I just couldn't even, I was so cold. And I, I just thought help can't be worse than this. And I overdosed on the opiates and I left the house I was at and I went just to get away from people and I got arrested on my way. And I've been pulled over by the cops so many times, but that night I didn't even care, it didn't even scare me. And this police officer was, was actually really gentle with me. He just put me in the front seat and took me to the jail. And then he's talking to me, and I, I always wonder, what was that all about? What did I have to say that night? Because he just sat there with his mouth open, watching me. Like, I just remember his face, and I'm thinking, what was I talking about? I mean, I'm dying. I, I'm just wondering, what, what did I talk about? And so, but I, I remember him getting up and going out of the room, and a bunch of people coming in and saying, we need to get you to the hospital, because they had search my purse or something and and then they called my sister and she came and got me and she kept saying my God is not going to let you die my God is not going to let you die and she took me to the Molson's house and he obviously <laughs> going to sleep this off well there's really no physical way I was going to live through it so I just I don't remember much of anything except that Barb took me to her basement. Like I was a shell of a person by then. And she said, Renee had told her, don't pray in the spirit, whatever you do. She's been in some bad stuff, that'll freak her out. Well, I was basically unconscious by then. So I remember being draped, Barb on the floor and I'm draped over her shoulder and I hear her crying. I mean, she is crying. And, and then I hear this voice saying to me, come to me, little girl, over and over and over. And I have no idea how to explain what happened, but I just, I remember that voice in my head. And then she told me that she said, I re I, she told me to say, I renounce you, Satan. And I did that, and then she asked me to do it again, and I did that. And then she said I passed out like I was limp. I just went totally still, which she told me even a different time 
how terrible that was, what was really happening there. She said that she knew I was, I was somehow experiencing hell. She could, she became so desperate. That's why she did what she did because she said it was terrible what was happening. And so she had me do that. And then she says, I couldn't even tell you were breathing. It's going from what I was to that, it scared her. And so then she said she saw this flash in her mind, like when Jesus would call out a demoniac and they would just appear as dead. So she went up and started cleaning her house because she didn't know what to do. And then, then Lauren brings my sister back and she obviously can't handle that even less. She's really upset that I'm not moving. And she goes and shakes me and picks me up and picked me up and I'm totally sober, I'm healed, I'm in my right mind. I've never been in my right mind as long as I can remember. And I I still remember that. I just was like, what just happened? Because <laughs> I had been out. I mean, I didn't even know what had happened. And it's 31 years later and I'm still trying to figure out what happened. People are like, what do you think happened? I'm like, I don't know what happened. <laughs> but I, I was suddenly well is what happened. And for, I have no memory of ever praying a sinner's prayer because it didn't happen after that. So it had to have only been with Lauren if it did happen. I don't know because I don't remember ever doing that. And then, um, but from that moment, I just chased Jesus. I was like, who did this to me? <laughs> and so... <laughs> said, wow, like, yay. And so now here I am, and I'm thinking, I know a whole bunch of people that need this to happen to them. And so needless to say, I had court because I had been arrested. And I remember the assessment. A week later, I'm with um, Kay Adamick. I don't know where she is now, but I uh, she was well aware of me by then. And she was um, like, what just happened? I don't know who this person is sitting here. And I said, I have no idea what happened. I don't know what happened. And I told her what I thought happened. And then she said, oh, I know what this is. She says, you were born again. I said, I, will, I was. <laughs> She's the one who told me. The chemical health assessors, the one who told me what happened. And then she said, I don't know what I'm gonna tell you, Judge, but I don't want you to go to treatment. I want you to stay in church. I want you to make it. She said, if you get confused, I know what's gonna happen to you. And so she really kind of guided me down a path and the judge actually agreed and said, if you end up back in front of me, then you're going to treatment. But I, I never did end up back in front of the judge. The police officer who arrested me that night came and saw me two years later. I was speaking somewhere and he was just shaking. He said, I saw your name, and I thought, there can't be two girls by that name in this town. And he said, I, I thought you had died that night. He said, I've always been so troubled by that night. And so it was about two weeks after this happened, my sister was friends with Brad, their son, and we were at Wendy's eating because, by the way, I hadn't eaten for 10 years. <laughs> now I'm eating like a normal human. and. I said to Brad, does your mom pray in a different language? And he said, no, yes. <laughs> and I said, well, I realized that the words that I was hearing in my mind were not in English. And I'm thinking, but I heard them in English. And then I'm thinking, but the, voice, the words I hear are not in English. And I can't explain that to anyone either, but I'm unconscious interpreting her spirit language and so somehow that's where I connected with God so I have not ever seen the dead raised but just trust me I believe for it because I was as close to that as you can get like I was not in rational thought at all for those last few weeks so then I was a real I don't know how to say a piece of word to try to get steered into right order because I hadn't had it for my whole life, I had no idea how to be in normal, be around normal people. So, but I was so passionate for Jesus from that moment on. 
that everything I did, and in even wrong turns, I would always be like, I gotta get back to him. And I never, ever used drugs again. I never drank again. I never smoked again, and I was a heavy smoker. None of those things ever returned again. I was completely set free of all of it. And I really had to learn how to slow my mind down, and then at some point I just gave up. But I, I went to Minneapolis about eight years later because I thought, there's no one in Albert Lee that is as sick as I was. That was my thought. I need to be where I can see miracles happen. And so that's when I went up to work for Teen Challenge in 1999. I just wanted to be a janitor. I just asked them, I'll be a janitor. I just want to be where miracles happen. And so I ended up um, doing a lot of different roles there. For 20 years I worked there, but I, in, in 2017 God was calling me to back outside because my heart and my passion is with the absolute distraught, heartbroken, destroyed, there's no hope for me, God would never even look at me, that's what I am for. And so when you're inside of somewhere working, you're not in that, and I was getting really, really um, it was really hard for me. So I decided in 2017 that I was going to follow God out into, well, what people consider nothing. No job, no title. You're giving all that up. I said, I'm giving up nothing. I'm going out to see miracles happen. I want to see miracles happen. I want to see Jesus heal people. And so... In 2019, it took me a minute, but I completely um, left all organized ministry. Now I just walk, I walk alongside of those who are already, I'm not trying to build anything and I'm not trying to be anybody. I don't even care about any of that. I live to exalt Jesus. That is all I care about. And I have been humbled and I have been humbled and I have been humbled every which way because I don't care what man tries to do to put you in something that means you've arrived or you this. I have found that emptiness in absolute everything, including ministry. I want to see Jesus. I want to see him in people. And so that's what I do. I just, now I'm, we're out with the homeless and he sent me an intercessor while I was still inside Teen Challenge. She prays in the spirit eight hours a day, and then I try to keep up with what happens up out of that. So if you want to be ministered to by her, she's the most amazing human I've met. Similar story, but Seven Bells Refuge is our YouTube channel. She'll pray in the spirit for hours on her YouTube channel. And she'll, she'll do the word, and then like she's got 41,000 views on her Psalm 91. So... It's, we're all about the word, and we're about Jesus, and nothing else. So, right now, what happens is people call us when their person is basically going to die, going to commit suicide. When people know, this is it for me. There's nothing anybody can do for me now. That's where we want to be called in. Because that's, both of our faith level is right there. Nothing before that, everyone before that drives us crazy because we don't want to talk. <laughs> We're not trying to counsel you about your addiction or whatever's going wrong. We just, we want absolute prayer. We're going for the prayer lane completely and serving. We like to serve too. So that's what happened. Barb and Lauren were the two people. Well, I'm not sure that they by choice wanted to be the two people that believed <laughs> that I could be healed, but somehow between the two of them, I ended up radically chasing Jesus. I don't quite know. <laughs> Lauren's story is 